Hello, ladies, and welcome to another episode of The Genius Podcast. My name is Karen Doyle, your host and founder of The Genius Project, an initiative for Catholic women designed to support and resource them towards growth in all areas of life, spiritual, personal, and professional. We seek to do this through the Catholic Women's Masterclass, the Rhythms of Renewal Program, the Genius Podcast, the Catholic Coaching Programs for Women, as well as the Genius Academy and our live virtual Catholic Women's Summits. If you are interested in finding out more about any of these initiatives, please visit our website at www.geniusproject.co. At the heart of what we do at the Genius Project is a deep desire to see every Catholic woman really embrace and live from her own unique genius. That firstly, every woman would have a revelation of their own belovedness, their own value, worth and dignity. And then once they have this revelation, that they would step into living their unique genius, their unique mission and purpose in the world. But my experience coaching and working with women over 20 years is that so many women struggle in this area of self-worth. They either feel that they are too much or that they are not enough. And they spend a lot of their time apologizing, not so much for what they do, but for who they are. To help me explore this topic of self-worth and how we can live our beauty and our genius in the world, I am joined today by Nicole Curuso. Nicole is a wife, mother, makeup artist, and beauty consultant. She is also the author of the book, Worthy of Wearing, and the movement, Worthy of Wearing. So ladies, no matter what age or season of life you find yourself in, this conversation with Nicole has so much for everybody. So I invite you to sit back, relax, and enjoy this conversation with Nicole Curuso. Well, Nicole, welcome to the Genius Podcast. We are really honored to have you joining us this day. And I think it's what coming up for 9 p.m. over in the U.S. It's midday for us. So welcome. Thank you so much for having me. Oh, it's lovely to have you. I came across your Instagram page, I think maybe 18 months ago. And so we've been touching base over a period of time talking about doing a podcast with both of us are mums and have yes. busy lives. So it's such a gift. So thank you. Oh, I'm so glad we could, we could talk finally. Nicole, the listeners know that you are the author of this book, Worthy of Wearing, which we're going to deep dive into in this podcast interview. But I'm wondering if you can give us a little bit of background about yourself and how you came to be where you are today. Of course. So yes, I'm a mother of three. I'm currently pregnant with my fourth and my husband and I have been married since 2009. Um, we got married super young, but, um, before that really, I think I just fell in love with fashion at a very young age. Um, my parents actually met while working in New York city in the garment district, uh, which is another funny story for another day, <laughs> uh, but a very serendipitous meeting. And uh, so it was always just a thread in my life, quite literally. Um, something that we loved as a family was just getting dressed up, looking our best. Um, I'm also Italian American. So there's also this kind of piece of European culture that's always been present in my life. Um, so after school, I went on to work as a makeup artist and just fell in love working really face-to-face -face with women, helping them find things that made life a little easier, helping them see the beauty, the inherent beauty in, in themselves. Um, but I didn't stop there. I really just had this dream of working actually in the fashion industry, going to fashion week, you know, dressing models, all the things. And so um, I was able, uh, able to do that uh, in, I would say it was around 2010, 2011, uh, able to move back to the city, work there and just get this experience, this bird's eye view suddenly became this, you know, I was just completely immersed in the fashion industry and got to see what it was really like. And it was very exciting, but there were also some very eye-opening things um, that were very contrasting to my experience working with women in makeup. And so I really just was longing to get back to that. Um, and so, of course, as my faith deepened and as I wanted to really serve the Lord in a, in a more intentional way, I realized I wasn't being called to stay in the fashion industry. Um, I did leave and um, had a little miracle rainbow baby and became a mother. Mm -hmm. uh, and so my story has just evolved from there. Mm, gosh. So you grew up in New York. Is that where you were based? 
I was born there and then we were lived in Connecticut, which is, was really like 40 minutes over the border. Uh, and then, uh, you know, used to go into the city all the time. Yeah. So that would have been an interesting experience. I've been to New York with Jonathan a number of times. It's a great city, but I can't imagine living there. It's a great city to visit. Was it exhausting or was it? I loved it. I loved living there. (laughs) Um, my husband and I lived there as a married couple and it was just, we had so much fun. We barely had two pennies to rub together, but we loved being able to go for walks and, uh, experience the parks and the water and the food. And, um, yeah, we were both kind of people, people. So we just loved loved the the sidewalk culture and everything. Yeah, It is exciting. I know in, um, 2017, my husband gave a keynote and the kids and I all went with him. We did a world trip, London, Dubai, Iceland to the United States and we had 10 days in New York as a family in the lead up to him giving this keynote in St. Louis and it was fantastic we were right near Central Park we were up at East Side and just a couple of blocks from Central Park and we just walked everywhere so you would know how far this is um, up at East Side halfway up Central Park right down to the Twin Tower Memorial so we walked our little (gasps) I know I know how long was that Jonathan's like, I mean, walked down to the memorial and I had no concept of how far it actually was. And our poor little. Oh my goodness. <laughs> it's a long way, isn't it? It's a long way. And it's a lot of, you know, you stop every block, you know, mm-hmm. especially if you hit, get a red light. So um, what an experience. I mean, to just see really every neighborhood the whole way down must have been so it, fun. It was fascinating. The kids loved it. They still have good memories. But, you know, later that year, my parents offered to mind our three kids. And I actually flew over and met Jonathan. He was on a five week speaking tour in the October. And so we had um, a whole week in New York on our own. And that was oh, a wow. totally different experience. So it was fun. Yeah. Yeah. Really, yeah, really fun. I yeah. know it's different when you have little people with you. I think they find it more exhausting. <laughs> I think they do, but it also opens your eyes. I actually love traveling with the kids because I've mm-hmm. done things that I would never have done if it was just Jonathan and I. So it's, they open your world as well, but oh, absolutely. it's nice to do the adult things. <laughs> of course. Yeah. So Nicole, were you always raised Catholic? Were you born and bred with faith? I was baptized Catholic, but my parents were not really practicing the faith the way that they are now. Um, I had a reversion really. I think when I was around 16, there was this very sweet nun at a, uh, we had moved towns in Connecticut and she invited me to come to this confirmation retreat to make friends because I was new there, even though I had already been confirmed. Um, and I was a very sort of snarky teenager at the time and told my mom, I didn't want to go. (laughs) And, uh, she said, well, if you don't do that, you won't make any friends. So of course that was my motivation, but I truly experienced Christ's love in a very, very particular way that evening. Um, which led me to just have this deep desire to learn and to know him more and to really understand the beauty of our Catholic faith. Um, so it's, I, you know, I still feel very under catechized. There's so many things I'm still learning. I'm, I'm a homeschooling mom. So I'm kind of learning with my daughter, yes. <laughs> which is wonderful. Yes. Um, but, you know, I do feel behind the eight ball sometimes on some of these things. Mm, but it's been a journey, obviously. And yes. you've been able to weave your faith now through your love with the fashion industry and those two passions yeah. coming together created this beautiful movement that you started when did you actually begin the worthy of wearing sort of mindset idea where did that evolve from that was in 2018 I started talking to just you know my girlfriends on Instagram saying do you ever feel like you know you've got these beautiful clothes and you just don't wear them or you have these favorite shoes and you just think today is not the day for those and you make up a million excuses And everyone sort of chimed in like, yes, I just don't feel like it's worthy of wearing. I don't feel like it's, you know, it's nice enough to wear on a regular day of the week. And uh, so we were all just going back and forth and that, that phrase worthy of wearing really stuck. Mm. Um, And it, it truly was this idea that I don't feel I'm special enough for the clothing piece, you know, kind of making an idol of this clothing piece or whatever it was. Mm. Um, and when I really started to examine that in prayer and understanding like, well, but God made me really special and I'm more special than this sweater. So, you know, (laughs) what's the disconnect going on here? 
um, it was really that I had to kind of grow in this acceptance of I'm a daughter of Christ and I should feel that way every single day. And if putting on something that's externally beautiful makes me feel more special, more close to him, I think as women, we're very drawn to beauty. Mm. Um, and then, then I want to do that, you know, and I think this, this mood lift came and I had, you know, littles at the time I had a, a, a one-year-old and a four-year-old. Yeah. Um, so it, you know, those were just days of trying to survive and, the and I found exactly. And, and, and I found that that, uh, that little act of care for myself made a world of difference in my disposition. Mm. And so kind of examining that in prayer and spiritual direction and kind of saying like, okay, where is God working here? Because this isn't purely human, you know, this isn't just a material thing. There's something happening in my heart, you know? Yeah. And I think um, you touched on those words, something happening in my heart. Mm -hmm. I think sometimes we can ignore and push those things aside, those little promptings and maybe consider them self-indulgent or maybe they're weak, or maybe we just don't have time to acknowledge them. But often the Holy Spirit is moving in our life through those promptings. And so that's what you're explaining right now, that you had this huge prompting from the Spirit. Just around your revelation, too, of your worth and your dignity. I love the worthy of wearing. And you mentioned that you had these beautiful clothes. that the, So the clothes were worthy of wearing, but that you yourself are actually worthy of wearing beautiful clothes and taking care of yourself in that way, which is really beautiful. So Yeah, and I, hadn't, I hadn't connected that it was something that would reflect in my heart. I think a lot of times we separate, oh, my physical body and my soul. Mm -hmm. And I think this for me was like Christ kind of like, was like, wait a minute, <laughs> there, these are connected, you know? So uh, being able to share and see other women felt the same way is really where this whole thing began. Yes. I remember I read somewhere you've written in one of your blog posts just around this idea that you're wearing your everyday mum clothes, yeah. <laughs> the mum clothes, whatever they are for everybody. And you realise that if you actually dolled up and, you know, put some nice clothes on, earrings, makeup, just some beautiful clothes in your wardrobe that have been sitting there for such a long time, it made you feel better. Mm -hmm. And I, I think sometimes we need to give ourselves permission as women that it's actually okay, that if you're a mum at home, you don't have to, I mean, we can wear tracksuit pants, right? But you don't have to wear that every day. Sometimes that little lift makes a huge difference in our vocation of motherhood, how we engage with our children, with our husband and our sense of mission. And I love how you've tied in this worthy of wearing across so many different facets of our lives as women, because you also tie it into a sense of mission, don't you? And purpose. Can Absolutely. you elaborate a little bit on how you did that and what your insights were that led to that place? Well, I think once I started to feel that boost of confidence um, from wearing some of my favorite things, now that's different for every woman, right? I mean, we don't all love the same styles and some of us love makeup, some of us don't, but whatever that thing is for you that you feel great in, you feel like yourself in, um, it lifts the spirits. And then after that, after that happens, you can be so much more present to the people that you're entrusted to every day. So whether you are out working, whether you are, you know, home with your children, whatever your state in life is, um, when you feel confident, you sort of forget about yourself as long as it's coming from a healthy place of, you know, intentionality. Um, and when you can do that, you really do live out your mission um, in, in a much more intentional way. So you're using your gifts, you're making people feel seen and loved and known. You're, you're trying to create solutions and, and bring beauty into this world and, and do all the wonderful things women do with that, you know, that maternal love that we have. Um, so I really feel because we have this calling as women to love people in such a specific way with that receptivity, we really do owe it to Christ to take good care of ourselves so we can kind of put our best self out there for others. Mm -hmm. um, so once, once that connection sort of happened in my mind and heart, I thought, oh my goodness, if, if more women knew this, imagine, imagine the love that we could share with our families. Imagine the kindness we could show to the woman at the grocery store when we're not so focused inward, we're not so insecure, we're not so 
oh, you know, just feeling heavy and like, here I am in another day wearing leggings and greasy hair. And, you know, I guess this is my life as a mom, or I guess this is, you know, and so sort of that resignation that starts to build up. And um, I think when we do give ourselves permission, like you said, uh, there's this freedom in that. And that freedom breeds so many other beautiful things. Mm, that's so beautiful. I, I think what you touching on what you said there, that is this just my life as a mum? I see that in the lives of so many people. And it's not even people who have children. Sometimes it's, is this just my life, this grind of this career mm-hmm. or in this task or in this relationship? And there's a sense of hopelessness that starts to set in when we actually resign ourselves to the fact this is just the way it is. But think, um, Pope Benedict beautifully said, you know, we're not made for comfort, we're made for greatness, and we're actually called to aspire to something greater than ourselves. And I w- I'd love you to touch on the difference and how we make that distinction, because sometimes there's a bit of a wrestle and a tension between is this worldly or is this godly, that mindset of, you know, taking care of ourselves or whatever it is, like aspiring to greatness, there's a distinction that has to be made. And you made that in prayer yourself. I'm wondering if you can touch on, I guess, the difference between differentiating between a worldly view of fashion and and looking after ourselves and dressing up and then a godly mindset towards that. I'm so glad you brought up that quote from Pope Benedict. He's one of my favorite writers. I just love how he takes these expansive things and makes them just a little simpler. Mm -hmm. Um, I think that when you are aspiring to greatness, you're forming habits and forming habits is really hard. (laughs) Um, Whether you're trying to get more exercise or drink more water or literally get up and get dressed every day. um, Sometimes those things are the simplest and also the hardest thing to do, which is why I love, you know, St. Jose Maria Escriva talks about that heroic minute, just get up and get out of bed. You know, that for some people is painful, really, really painful. Um, so with worthy of wearing in the past, we've done, uh, challenges, like a 30 day challenge of saying, let's, let's try to work this muscle every single day, do one thing that makes you feel put together. And I think the differentiation happens there because when you're trying to build a habit, you're trying to do it for others. Yes, you're taking care of yourself, but you're really doing it for the end result of, I want to be a better Christian. I want to be a better mother. I want to be more present to the people in my life. Um, So I'm just going to do this small thing every day that actually brings me to that end goal. Um, The difference in the fashion industry that I saw uh, really firsthand was that, um, beauty was not for the sake of loving others. Beauty was for the sake of loving self. Mm. Um, so that distinction of vanity and worldliness comes from this, this love of self, this want, you know, wanting to be noticed, wanting to be preferred, um, basically read the litany of humility (laughs) and it's all the opposite, you know, (laughs) uh, you can have a healthy humility and wake up and wear lipstick every day. And I think as women of faith, sometimes there's a a fear there. Like, I don't want to be, I don't want to be kind of tiptoeing on that line of vanity. I want to stay away from that. So therefore I'm just not going to take care of myself at all. And dress Um, down. I I I I remember studying Jonathan and I studied at the John Paul II Institute in Melbourne and we encountered some women there. They were, they came to visit actually, they weren't studying with us, but they came to visit. And one of them I was wearing a dress and she just didn't think that Catholic women should wear dresses or look nice. And I gave her a book to read and it totally changed her life. Similar to what you're saying that she actually had permission. She Mm -hmm. wasn't called to dress down. Like she's called to, you know, express and make manifest the glory of God that's within her. And like you said, we do that through our beauty. So I think that dressing down is a, can be a really big issue for some women because they think that that's actually humility when it's not. And I think, you know, all of us are called to different charisms and and different um, devotions within the faith. And I do believe some women do feel called to that kind of simpler life. You know, there's definitely some validity there, but I would say the majority of us are, who are out in the world um, really are, are called to bring attention to that dignity we have that comes from God. Um, you know, we are the only creation he made in his own image. How beautiful, how special meditating on that is, is, can be Mm. life-changing. And so 
I, I think it's important to realize, am I, do I feel at peace dressing up a bit? You know, do I feel at peace there? Um, do I feel that insecurity creeping in? Do I feel that focus on self and on, you know, inward when I'm not taking care of myself? I think that's something important to discern just like anything else. Um, you know, what is my intention and, and how am I trying to put myself out in the world and why, what is my, why, um, I think, you know, that's why I I made my book have this element of self-examination because if we just simply get up and get dressed and throw on our most expensive shoes and our most expensive dress and just, ah, oh, you know, la di da, um, that is, that is also not the point of this. You know, it really is to have a healthy understanding of what's the simplest thing I can do to be the best version of myself. Yes. Yeah. I love that. And like you said, it's, it's with intention and discernment. So absolutely there are women who feel called to a more simple way of living, but I actually find women who have chosen that way of living, they still glow and they still radiate this beauty because it's coming from a deeper place. It's, there's a difference between living that way. And then you can have a woman who is got her makeup on and her heels on, but she does not radiate beauty. She does not radiate peace. And I think what you touch on there, it's about coming before the Lord under the gaze of the Holy Spirit. And in many ways, it's actually about receiving our identity as the beloved daughter from him. Because I actually think that's where the beauty comes from in women, Mm -hmm. regardless of what they look like. But then it's about how do we live that in the world? And that's what you're saying with this worthy of wearing, which is so beautiful. Yes, it's, I really wanted the book to be a resource that was both practical, you know, simple things, what sort of things do I like to wear every day, you know, uh, but also, um, taking that deeper examination to prayer and saying, okay, what season of life am I in? What state in life am I in? What's the most practical thing for me right now? You know, I'm not dressing the way I did when I lived in New York city today, because I have just a different state in life and a different season right now. Um, I also just moved from a sort of moderately kind of four season climate to a subtropical climate. Uh, so my whole entire life changed, uh, there. And and it's, <laughs> exactly, exactly. Um, and so I actually relish when the air conditioning is on cold, I get to wear a bit of a sweater, um, which is not normal for <laughs> South Florida. <Yeah. laughs> what I said to you before, are you wearing a jumper in Florida? Yeah. <laughs> so no it's beautiful now you talk about inviting women and inspiring them to explore their feminine genius by investing in their self-worth can you explain a little bit what you mean by that like how do women actually explore their feminine genius and how is their self-worth linked to this like what practical things can they do I guess spiritually and practically in terms of how they dress to I guess overcome some of those obstacles Yeah. I think, you know, a lot of us, uh, I would say almost all of us grow up in, in life, experiencing joys, trials, sufferings, everything in between. Um, and sometimes we carry that and we carry that into our relationship with God. We carry that into the way we view him as our father. Um, we carry that in the way we look at ourselves and think about ourselves and even maybe talk about ourselves. And so, um, sort of those wounds and that negativity can really impact uh, how we understand what feminine genius is, uh, how we understand what it means to be a daughter of Christ. Um, And I think when you're able to take that time to work on your heart, to work on, you know, your, your personal development, your spiritual development, um, and really start to understand God as this merciful, loving father, um, that is where I think the feminine genius starts to kick in It's because it's, I never really understood it. I honestly, especially because I had a reversion later in life. Um, I didn't really know what John Paul II meant by that term. I thought, well, feminine, okay. That means like pink and dresses and Absolutely. I need to like change everything. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know know. about you, but I'm so not into the pink puff sleeves and dress, you know, like I love my dress, but yeah. No, I I think I I felt, I felt disconnected from this idea of femininity because I never connected with the super girly presentation of femininity. So for me, I had to explore it from a relational point of view of like, what is my relationship as a woman to Christ? What is, and I, and sort of looking to saints like Mary Magdalene of like, how did he treat this beautiful woman who was a great sinner. 
Mm-hmm. Um, and how did he bring redemption to her story? And I think there's many saints and many holy women that we can look to and say, oh my goodness, if he can have that transformation in her life, just purely from his love and mercy and from her willingness to change and let go of those things that were keeping her from loving him fully. Um, that's where I think you begin to see your feminine genius. You're able to accept that love from him and then also accept and give love more freely to mm-hmm. others. Um, and that's where I think I started to understand, okay, femininity is not just about bows <laughs> and lace. It's truly about love. It's about the way we give and receive love and how we can mirror the love of Christ to the people in our life. And, um, and it's a very, very special mission and it looks different for every woman in the specific ways that she lives it out. But at the end of the day, it's really just about how we love others and how we let him love us, even in those, those wounds, even in those places where that we don't want him to look, we're like, please don't look over there. You know, um, letting him look and letting him see the way that he let Thomas put his hand in his side. You know, um, I think beautiful transformation comes from that beautiful confidence comes from that. And a sense of, um, a sense of self Mm -hmm. of like, I'm broken, but I'm filled with him, you know, that's a kind of confidence that no dress will ever give you. (laughs) Absolutely. Absolutely. Did you ever have a moment in your life? I can think of many in mine where you sort of, you were struggling with this self-worth and that I, I, I don't know if you've got any stories that you can share, but I do remember many years ago, I think I was in grade 12 and I had to go to um, my boyfriend's mum passed away and I had to find some clothes for the funeral. And I was really lacking in confidence to begin with. And no matter what I wore (laughs) or what I tried on, none of it worked. And it just made me feel worse and worse about myself. And it's interesting now, you know, fast forward so many decades later where I have experienced, I guess, that restoration in my self-worth where I feel really comfortable in who I am. And so my clothing choices now are very much about yeah, just expressing who I am and rather than sort of trying to be something or someone else. I don't, does that make sense? Have you ever had an yes. experience similar to that? You know, I can think of one specifically right now, um, when I was kind of in my later teen years, um, I studied abroad in Rome and I met some just wonderful women, um, who were there studying abroad with me and they all did dress in this very feminine, uh, lovely way. Some of them were from, they were from women from all over the world. Some were from actually Australia, Mexico, the United States, um, and I was sort of this, like, felt like a tomboy around them. Um, and when I came home from that trip, sort of looked at all of my, you know, jeans, sneakers, t-shirts, and was like, this has got to go, you know, this is just not me, you know, anymore. I'm different now. You know, you kind of have those like yes. funny phases as a teenager. <laughs> I'm just going to change everything. Uh, and I started dressing in a way that I felt was like sort of what these women would wear, who I thought were just gorgeous mm-hmm. and, and just lovely. Um, and anytime I went anywhere, I was spending silly amounts of time trying on outfits. Does this match? Does this look good? Does this go with this? And just taking all of this time away from whoever I was supposed to meet. So I, you know, you, you end up late because you're so focused on this thing. And I, and I never felt authentic. You know, I, there were many occasions where I finally got to the place I had to go. And I was still so insecure that I would just, people would be like, you know, flapping their lips and I couldn't hear a thing. And I would just be so not present. um, so insecure and worried about myself, maybe even worried about the clothes themselves. Maybe they weren't modest enough. And so they were like riding up and riding down and moving all the wrong places. Um, and so after doing that for so many years, I just thought like, this is just not me, but I don't really know where to go from here, you know? (laughs) And so that's where, yeah, the heart work really started to come in, um, kind of started to attack, like, and it really honestly was the wisdom of my spiritual director. She sort of like noticed it, but was so gentle and said, you know, Nicole, tell me about this kind of transformation (laughs) you've had lately, you know, and, and having to explain it is very, that was that was it for me. I couldn't explain it. it She just said, yes, it was, it was saying like, you know, for her to say, okay, tell me why you've had this sort of identity 
crisis and change and what's going on. Uh, and I think because I really didn't have a good enough reason other than I want to look like those girls, um, that's when I realized it was just, it was all fake. You know, it was all just this wanting to be somebody else, Mm. um, which was really taking away from me being myself and being able to use my gifts and speak to people in a way that I, you know, felt confident. So, um, I think when you have enough of those experiences, you, uh, realize, okay, something has to change. Mm. And for me, it had to start in my heart, you know, and, and then the clothing kind of came later. Absolutely. Yeah. We were, I was talking to someone else on a podcast. We were talking about fasting actually, and how look, we're talking about spiritual fasting within the context of Lent. And we're saying how biologically and just physically, we need to sort of get on top of the food first. And then that spiritual revelation comes. And I think what, that's exactly what you're, you're touching on here, that we are this unity of body and soul and that the work actually has to start in the heart and then it works its way out to the exterior. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And you, you know, you, you see kind of what's going on in the world right now with all of this confusion about gender and all these things. And some people think that, you know, just putting on a dress makes you a woman. Um, And it's, you know, what we're kind of repeating here is that from the theology of the body, from the way that God created us, that's just not possible. You know, it's not possible. So even as a woman throwing on a very girly outfit for me, was still not authentic to me. So it, it, it is going so much deeper. Um, and it really isn't about the clothes only. Yeah, absolutely. And so I guess for women who are sort of in a season at the moment where they might be struggling with their self-worth and just, I guess, body image and where they're at in terms of those sort of things, what advice would you have for them? Well, I, I always like to start with this piece of advice, which is that, um, really go into your closet and find the things that you do love. It might be one thing, honestly. I know some of us, it's, we don't have a closet, all of us full of clothes that we really, really love. Sometimes it's one thing. And I think start there and sort of examine it. What is it that you love about it? What is it that you love about the way you feel when you're in it? And then how do you replicate that? Mm -hmm. Um, You know, I think even sometimes asking someone close to you, like, you know, when I wear such and such dress, I feel great. And from your perspective, like, what is it, do I, what is it that's different than versus me wearing something totally different? Mm. And I think for, for me, it's my husband is always my, my person, um, (laughs) early in marriage, I was always trying to figure out my style. And I remember one day he just said to me, like, honey, you just, you look great in pants and it's okay. You don't have to wear a dress to fit in with all the other girls, you know? Um, and just hearing him say that, I was like, okay, I'm done. I'm (laughs) done trying to wear a shift dress, you know? (laughs) Yeah, absolutely. My husband hates, he hates the, uh, we call them stingray tops, but they're, you know, the big frilly tops that come out from the shops. So it's just a no-go. We don't have stingray tops. (laughs) I, you know, it's funny how they know you so well, so they can speak to you honestly and lovingly and sort of remind you like, no, 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 this is who you really are. Um, but I think to go back to that, that one piece about women who aren't feeling very confident, Mm -hmm. I think it's really important to invite Christ into that in prayer, you know, go to adoration, sit in front of a crucifix, um, invite him to reveal to you what he loves about you, what he thinks is beautiful about you. And it's a little bit emotional. And I think sometimes some of us don't want to like unravel that much. You know, we, we want to keep things sort of business (laughs) as much as we can, because we have to go out and do other things. But, um, if you can give yourself that time with him in prayer, uh, some beautiful transformation can happen, you know, whether you're journaling or you just, you know, you can hear his, you know, his, his loving words speak to you. Um, that is so powerful. And I think from there you can connect. Okay. The clothing part is is easy after that. Yes, absolutely. And as you're talking there, I just I had this um this voice just remind me of this scripture. You know, just in Genesis, the order of creation, and that the woman was the final creature and thing that God created. And that people joke. You know, I often speak at a men's conference and tell the men that you know, in the woman, God perfected His workmanship. She was the <laughs> pinnacle of creation, and she was mm-hmm. She's the most beautiful. Yeah. She reveals that beauty that, you know, the transcendentals, truth, beauty, and goodness, there is a very special and unique way in which a woman 
reveals beauty to the world and to the people around her. And I think God really delights in us. He delights in that beauty. And it's okay for others to delight in that, whether it's a husband and children or people we encounter. It's actually a gift. Mm-hmm. But because of the way our culture is, it's become so hypersexualized and people are really trying to prove their worth in how they look and hustle for value and hustle for identity. They've lost a sight, lost sight of that, I guess, that that call of God to be delighted in, that it's okay. And some women, you know, attract, they feel they attract too much attention. Some women feel they don't attract enough attention. And that's where they get caught in this vicious cycle. But returning to the Lord and asking him to reveal, like you said, the way he sees you and his Mm -hmm. vision for womanhood, his vision for your womanhood and how you live that out vocationally. I think that's a really, really important starting point. Yeah, that's that's a beautiful thing to remember about creation and about our, um, you know, that essence of who we are, that mystique of womanhood. Mm. Um, and there's just so much to unpack in in that alone. But um, but I really do invite all the ladies listening today to um, no matter where you are in the spiritual journey, um, to just invite Christ to remind you of who who He created you to be what gifts and talents he gave you, how you can use those to serve him um, and, and invite our lady to show you what to wear. I swear. I mean, I ask her all the time. I'm like, when I, if I have to go out and buy a specific thing for an event, I, I invite our blessed mother, please help me find this certain thing. And it's, it's usually on sale or it's the last one in my size or, you know, and so it sounds so frivolous and silly, but, but like you said, um, that delight in that beauty, it, it touches other people. Mm-hmm. And I think for me, seeing my, my four-year-old son tell me, oh, mama, you look so nice today. I mean, that is not something anyone told him to say, you know, no. uh, and, and just that innocence and that, that just of seeing beauty and saying, and, and, and saying to me that, you know, recognizing it yes. um, is very powerful. And I think you touch on something, the impact of beauty on the male. And we all Mm -hmm. know, I guess, with pornography and all that, the impact of perverted what's so-called beauty and how that entices men. But there's something about that pure beauty that elevates men and elevates, I guess, their soul and their gaze towards something greater than just us standing in front of them. I know my son's the same. He'll often comment. And my nephew, my little three-year-old nephew too, always say, oh, you look so pretty. And it it really impacts the soul that kind of. Yes. Yeah. It's beautiful. And I I love seeing the, like you said, the way that they almost treat you that much more special when they think you look beautiful. Um, And, and it's just a wonderful exchange of that masculine genius and feminine genius and sort of how we inform each other's dignity um, through our own. So it's, it's very special. It is. And I think also when you carry a sense of your own worth, it's not that you demand it, but you do expect to be treated with that same level of respect. And so it does cause people to stand up a little bit and makes them reevaluate how they're treating others. So it has a knock on effect through a whole range of areas in our relationships as well. So it's so much more than just putting on a dress, as you say. Yes. Yes. Oh, of course. And I, I love how many relationships and, and even simple connections, especially when you're walking around a city that you can make uh, just simply by acknowledging, oh, you know, I, you look beautiful or I love your shoes or, you know, and, and sort of that, that because as women, I think we connect on those terms many times, it just gives that possibility for friendship. It gives a possibility for uh, a relationship or, or an exchange that just simply makes someone's day better. And I think that's another part of our, our feminine genius and our kind of maternal love that we can share with a stranger even. Absolutely. And we talk about with the feminine genius that being the redeemed and the unredeemed side of our qualities of the feminine genius. So the redeemed side is that affirmation and that generosity in terms of building others up. But the unredeemed side is that criticism and that competitive spirit that often breeds so incessantly through different women's relationships, particularly when it comes to fashion and comparing Mm. and all of that. And so I often think it's so much more powerful to move in the opposite spirit. So when you do sense that, oh, look, you know, you often see people in a shopping center, you can watch them looking a woman up and down if she's beautifully dressed and it's not, they're not admiring her. They're 
they're measuring their value and how they look against this woman. And so I think it's always good to be able to catch ourselves and then go in the other spirit, just affirm, like you said, you look beautiful today, or I love your shoes. And just what a gift those words are to another person. We can never underestimate. Oh, absolutely. It's, and, and I know there've been times where I was caught off guard by a random stranger saying mm-hmm. something very kind. Mm-hmm. And it really turns, it turns your day around. You know, you yeah. start to think, oh gosh, life's not that bad. <laughs> I know. <laughs> you know? I remember when I was pregnant with my youngest and I, we couldn't have children for six years. And then every child I threw up for the full nine months, I was like, God said, well, you wanted children. Here you are. Oh gosh. That's and then so none hard. of them ever slept for the first year. Cause they all had reflux, but I was pregnant with my, my last child, my daughter, and I was so ill with her. And so my husband, he was so beautiful. He took me to a maternity store to buy me some nice clothes. Cause I, I looked like I was dying. My skin was oh. gray. I know no amount of makeup helped my cause, <laughs> but he was beautiful. He took me, it was probably going to be our last child. And knowing that and a month left of the pregnancy, he still, he blessed me with these beautiful clothes and I wore them. And I remember being in the shops one day and this woman came up to me. She just said, I just want to thank you for dressing so beautifully as a pregnant mom. She oh. said she was an elderly lady. She goes, we used to do that, but now the girls don't dress like this. And there's not a lot of modesty. She was, this was her reflection anyway, but she just wanted to thank me. And I, yeah, it made me feel really nice. <laughs> wow. I felt so enormous and so sick, but those clothes during that last month of pregnancy actually made me feel a whole lot better. So, Oh, that's so beautiful. Yeah. I've been there. I've been there too, just being mm-hmm. sick and thinking, what's you know another kind of what's the point yes. <laughs> if I'm just throwing up all day I know. The my head you in know. the toilet <laughs> yeah <laughs> but sometimes it's after throwing up putting on clean clothes and saying okay I'm just gonna we're gonna take it from here uh it does it does make a world of difference so absolutely um, yes oh well, I love that story that. yeah that yeah was, was well thank you so much I where can we direct women if they would like to know more about yourself or to your book or follow you well they can go to uh nicole m caruso.com is my website uh worthy of wearing.com is the website we've created for the book um, they can follow along on Instagram at nm caruso and I would love to connect with them there um, it's, it's my favorite thing. It's just connecting with other, other women who are trying to live that same life. Uh, it's such a blessing to me. So oh, I would God love that. You. God bless you. And God bless the rest of your pregnancy. And thank and you. Forever. So ladies, I hope you found that conversation with Nicole, both insightful and helpful. If you would like to purchase her book, worthy of wearing, follow the movement, worthy of wearing, or read her blog posts. I invite you to check out the links in the show notes for links to her book and her website. In all the years working and walking alongside women, I have never known one woman who hasn't struggled in this area of self-worth. So often our struggle around self-worth has so much to do with our mindset. And sometimes we can't quite overcome that mindset block on our own. Here at The Genius Project, we are offering group and one-on-one Catholic mindset coaching sessions. Now, these are delivered by professionally trained Catholic coaches who can help you overcome some of the negative and toxic mindsets which want to keep you contained so that you never step out into the fullness of who God created you to be. But sometimes it can be really hard to step out of something like a mindset that we have known for most of our life. This is where Catholic mindset coaching can be really, really helpful. Done under the gaze of the Holy Spirit, we walk you through an examination of what some of those limiting beliefs are and how you can actually experience transformation in those beliefs and the restoration that Jesus wants to bring to you. So ladies, if you're interested in any of those programs, please check out the website www.geniusproject.co. Until next week, ladies, have a beautiful week and God bless.